Welcome to the Let's Go podcast, where we help the leaders of entrepreneurial companies take their companies to the next level. Today, we're going to tackle the number one topic on the minds of CEOs everywhere. Whether you see the surveys from YPO, Vistage, McKinsey, Gartner, everyone's talking about it. It's the number one topic that keeps CEOs awake at night. And that topic is talent, access to talent, access and retaining amazing talent in today's market. Today, we're talking to talent whisperer, Amy and Sarah, my colleague at Hire Better. Amy is Managing Director at Hire Better, and over her 20-year career, she's held leadership positions in executive search, recruitment process outsourcing, and strategic talent planning. Before Hire Better, she was a VP of Client Service and Recruitment at Profound, and also a recruiting manager at Tatum. Amy also has a degree from the University of Texas. Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Kurt, for having me. This is a subject that I'm very passionate about, so I can talk about it all day. Thanks for bringing me on. Awesome. We have got a five-part mini-series for you guys today, where we're going to tackle talent and specifically how to hire better. I firmly believe that talent is the differentiator for high-growth companies and helping you achieve or not achieve your goals. Today, we're going to talk about part one, which is setting the foundation aligning your talent strategy with your business strategy. Amy, let's talk a little bit about why it's so important to align your talent strategy with your business strategy. I know you've got a lot of experience with strategic talent planning at Hire Better. I also know you've been a recruiter for years. Tell me why I need to do more than just go out and find somebody. That's a really good question, Kurt. When we talk about strategic talent planning, what we're talking about is really getting a clear understanding of what your long-term goals are, but then also understanding where are the gaps on your team so that you can build a talent roadmap that you can execute against and iterate upon. So what you're saying is if I have uh, 12 to 18 months and looking out to, to these hires I need to make, if I have 12 to 18 months to make a hire, I can make a great hire as opposed to what today's entrepreneurial companies typically do, and that is, you know, pro, you know, react to whatever their need is uh, at the moment. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what we see, you know, time and time again, is that companies that don't take that step back and really look at what is my long-term strategy and what does my long-term talent plan need to look like, they're hiring very reactively, and so they're not necessarily taking the time to hire the top talent. They're hiring what's readily available right now because their hair's on fire and they're they're in a panic rather than hiring the A player that's out there for that position. I like that. And if you think about it, it's not really just for hiring. It's also for assessing your existing team to see who can step up, who needs to be moved into another seat, perhaps maybe an individual contributor seat, or maybe who needs to find greener pastures, so to speak. Absolutely. And I think it's also a great opportunity for you to look at on my team, who needs coaching and training? Because you might have somebody that's maybe not a CFO now, but they have the capability that they could step into that seat. If you get them the right training and development at the right time, the right mentorship and coaching, you might have that ability to build your team as well as add to your team, which is so important right now. I really like the strategic approach to it, Amy, because uh, if so often we're called in because someone needs a CFO or CMO or whatever the title may be, but until we really understand what the rest of that picture looks like, what skills other members of the team have, we may have a different assessment of what the needs are based on what the rest oh, of the team looks like. Absolutely. And and that's that's something that we've discovered, you know, repeatedly over the years is that a client might think they need something because they're taking a very, I don't want to say myopic, but they're they're taking a small view. And when you really step back and look at the entirety of the organization and assess the individual team members, you really get a better sense of who can step in and what are the required skill sets that I need somebody to step in with uh, rather than pulling a job description from, from Google and just and, and making assumptions. You're, you're right-sizing based on the specifics for the roles that you're trying to fill. That's uh, funny. I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, some job description just amalgamated from all these wish lists of, of things. It really becomes a wish list at the end of the day. And it's really what they think they need, not what they truly need. And that's the biggest thing I, I've seen from uh, from entrepreneurial companies is knowing exactly what they should hire versus what they think they need to hire. Absolutely. So Amy, it, it makes it sound like recruiting is really table stakes. Like recruiting is, is, is half the battle, but the other half of the battle is really under, understanding what you truly need now and in the future. I would absolutely agree with that. I, you know, I, I think that one of the biggest issues that we see is as you said, that reactivity and, and really taking the step back and looking at what are my long-term goals, then better understanding what are my short-term goals allows you to really paint a, a more complete picture for what does my company need to look like right now versus six months from now versus a year, 18 months from now. 
Awesome, Amy. Uh, anything else you'd like to add as far as setting the foundation? Uh, I guess if there's anything that I could say around setting the foundation, it's take the time. And that's one of the things that we see that most companies don't do. They're so busy in uh, what you call the tyranny of the urgent. You've, I've heard you use that term over and over over the years. They're so busy with the tyranny of the urgent that they don't take the time to really step back and plan. And so then they're constantly in a state of the tyranny of the urgent because they haven't put the plans in place that they need to. Amy, tell us one uh, one takeaway from this episode, aligning your talent strategy with your business strategy. My big takeaway is take the time, do the planning and commit the time to making sure you understand your business strategy and your talent strategy. Amy, last time we talked about the importance of aligning your talent strategy with your business strategy. Today, we want to talk further about setting the foundation. You notice we haven't gotten into recruiting at all, but right now we're talking about setting the foundation and making your company a great place to work. Talk to me a little bit about those things that we hear about, but we don't often really pay attention to mission, vision, values, core purpose, et cetera. I'm glad that you asked about that. I think that it's something that has always those 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 topics have always been important but i think now in our current environment of work from home um, where we have you know record number of baby boomers that have retired and and millennials are you know fully over half of the working population now those items have come to the forefront even more uh, most folks today they want to have a deeper purpose and a deeper meaning in the work that they do. They're working from home. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to navigate all kinds of things that they've never navigated before. So having a, a really deep purpose in what they do and alignment with their team and their core values is more important than it's ever been. And Amy, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. You said a few times people are working from home and that part is, is true partially, but with this great resignation that we're hearing about, people are voting with their feet on who they want to work for. So they want to work for employers who do have a higher purpose, do have a deeper, bigger meaning than just a paycheck. Talk a little bit about that. I I read an Inc. study uh, the other day that said in a three-month period, March, April, and May, uh, 11 and a half million people resigned. They just resigned. It didn't, didn't have something that they were going toward, but they had something that they were walking away from. So you're absolutely right. Um, having that deep mission and purpose is, is so critical right now because there are so many other companies that have that have, you know, have looked at this and have identified that it's a really, really crucial need. And so the people that are developing those core mission, vision, values, and they're hiring to and and living those values, they're not just values and and mission that are on a wall, but they're really living them. That's something that that these folks are, you know, in in today's market, they understand and and they're moving toward. For those of you who might be rolling your eyes and say, well, it's it's just a job, you're out of touch, man. This is more than just a paycheck. This is actually standing for or doing something beyond their individual contributions. So, Amy, let's talk a little bit about core values. I know it's important to an organization, and uh, we want to make sure, as you said, it's not just a placard on a wall, but it means more. Tell me how you would encourage your clients to utilize your core value in specifically the recruitment process. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I think, first of all, I want to back up a little bit and say that that understanding what your mission is and understanding what your core values are, that's an exercise, right? It's its not three guys sitting in a room and saying, I think this is our core value. Don't you agree? It's much more than that. It's about understanding your team. It's about finding examples across the team of, of how people show up, right? What are the things, that, the qualities that are displayed over and over and over again? And it's really understanding at the core of what you do, what is it that's important? So at Higher Better, our mission is we impact lives by connecting and empowering good people to build great companies. And with that, everybody that shows up understands what is it that we're here to do? We're here to connect and empower, right? Both sides of the of the, of the stage. Um, now, when it comes to the core values piece of it, again, that's somewhere that, you know, you're going to need to do your homework and really understand how is it that we are geared as a company? And then, you, like I said, you can't just have them on a wall. You need to live them. So you need to find examples in your daily life that continually prove to the team and to each other that that's how you behave, right? This is how we, what we believe in our, in our business. So what, what's an example of, uh, of a way that you might uh, express your core values as a company? Well, one of our favorites is win together. And so when we when we are working on projects, we give each other what we call kudos, but we give each other kudos. And that is, thank you so much, uh, Kurt, you know, for um, for um, 
I'm sorry, I'm trying to come up with an example. Curse never done anything good is what you're <laughs> No, uh, you know, thank you, thank you so much, uh, you know, Jean, for working till, you know, we're working at your desk from five in the morning until six at night to get a project done, right? Or it's doing the things that that you do to support the people around you. I've got a better example. Let the record state that she had a good example for Jean, but not for her. <laughs> not for her. Well, I, I'll give I'll give a good example, and it's for our Garrett Mustin, who is our our marketing guru. If I'm the if I'm the recruiting whisperer, Garrett's the marketing whisperer, and I've been doing a, a couple of series of of speaking engagements, and Garrett's my wingman. So I sent a kudos out and said, thank you, Garrett, for being my wingman. And thank you, Kurt, for giving me pointers on how to be a better speaker. And thank you, Cisco, for helping me with the, you know, with the presentation. And thank you on and on and on. So it's about really empowering the team around you. And, and when you do that, they empower you back. And then you feel connected and part of a, a greater thing um, that builds loyalty and it builds trust. So that's an example of how you uh, demonstrate this within the organization. What about on the or in the hiring process when you're looking or talking to your clients or, or hire better about bringing in new people? How are you leveraging those core values to see if the candidates exhibit or, or have the, some of those same core values? You know, Kurt, when we talk about people interviewing for uh, core values and, and assessing core values in their interview process, this is where the importance of behavioral interviewing comes in. It's really important that you ask open-ended questions. So let's say integrity is one of your core values. You want to ask open-ended questions that touch on their experience working in an environment where they had to show integrity, right? It's, it's It starts with, tell me about a time when you had a, a, a you know, to somebody on your team that was lying to a client. How did you deal with it, right? There's all these great questions that you can ask that get to the core of somebody's integrity. So my suggestion would be that, that A, you need to make core values um, the central part of your of your interview process. Yes, their skill sets are important. And yes, the fact that they've done something previously is very important. But at the end of the day, if you don't share the core values of your company and of your teammates, then it's going to be a mismatch and it's going to be painful for everybody involved. I love it, uh, Amy. Thank you. For those of you who out there who are wondering how you get started with the real mission statement or real core values, uh, we don't do that at Hire Better, but we have partners who do. So I'd encourage you to reach out to me. My email address will be in our uh, comment section, but it's Kurt, K-U-R-T, at HireBetter.com. And we'll set you up with one of our partners who can help you design your mission, vision, value statements. Yeah, and Kurt, again, I, I would say that when you think about hiring and hi how to hire better, that first part starts with the foundation around talent strategy and business strategy. This is the next level of the foundation. It, this is this is like, you know, building a house and you're putting the next level of the foundation on to make sure that you've got your strategy, you've got your business strategy and your talent strategy. How do you make sure that you have the right people on your team? So Amy, what's the biggest takeaway for this episode, setting the foundation? You need to have a vision and a story and you need to give people something to believe in that's more than just a paycheck. I think that story that you're telling as an organization is so important, as you said, because people do not need, they need a job, but they don't need your paycheck. They want to, they want to join something bigger than that. Yeah. Let's talk about the talent you need at different levels of your organization. Let's start there. So we work with mostly entrepreneurial companies who by definition have a lot of uh, generalists on their team, people who are wearing a lot of hats, doing anything it takes to survive. But as you grow and scale, you need to start professionalizing your organization. And that's where I'd like to start. Kick me off, Amy. Absolutely. And as Kurt said, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And, and typically what those folks will do at the beginning of their life cycle is they'll hire readily available utility players, right? They're going to look at their network, friends and family, people that they can get to quickly. When the companies, as companies grow and scale, um, their need for talent of different levels shifts, right? So, so what was acceptable when they first started the company versus what they might need two years later when they're $20 million in revenue, there's a big difference. And so what we see of those companies, they get to a point, as Kurt said, where they need somebody who's got that, who's been there, done that, right? They, they've got the experience to, to grow the company to the next level that their current team just might not have. Let me um, dive a little deeper into something that Amy said, and this is a little secret for most of you entrepreneurs out there and, and the leaders of entrepreneurial companies. Most companies, as you grow and scale from $5 million to $10, twenty million million, you're going to outgrow members of your team. It doesn't necessarily mean that they need to go. It just means that they might not have the same leadership position that they had earlier in their, in their career. And we've seen 
of some incredible title inflation for entrepreneurial companies. So just want to warn you about that. It just means you might have to make some of these leaders put movement individual contributor roles. But that's just the level uh, and the state that your company is in. And I agree with you. And, and Kurt, we see that over and over again. And, and the way that I've seen leaders deal with it the best is to understand those people still have a place on the team. Um, and, and to give them work that's meaningful for, for the skill sets that they have. And, and often bringing in a leader who is the next level, who is there, been there, done that, is going to provide more opportunity to the people that are there because they're going to get additional training and mentorship that they wouldn't get otherwise. So don't look at that as a death knell. Look at that as an opportunity for you to continue to grow the people on your team. Excellent. I'm an entrepreneur myself. And so I can, I, I tell people I look in the mirror when I say this, but basically, I'm not going to be able to coach and mentor you to be the best CFO, CMO, whatever for your business. It's going to take somebody with those skills and a better a coach and mentor to do that than me, the entrepreneur, that's for sure. So Amy, let's talk a little bit about the talent in the marketplace today. And specifically, I want to build a team with A players, people who are, are incredible game changers. Um, tell me a little bit about the difference between what's called a, an active candidate, somebody actively looking for a job and a passive candidate, somebody who's not really looking for a job. Well, you just stole my thunder, Kurt, because that's the difference. <laughs> Internally at Hire Better, we make a distinction between what we call active candidates and passive candidates. So active candidates are the ones that are actively in the market. They might be out of a job. Um, they are, if they're still within a job, they're probably disgruntled. So they're the ones that are trolling job boards and they're applying to, to positions on job boards in direct opposition to a passive candidate. And a passive candidate is actively involved in building the A company that they're working with, right? They're intellectually curious, problem solvers, high performers, and they're not looking because they're engaged with their current company. And when you think about hiring top talent, you want to go after the passive candidate. The passive candidates are the ones that have been there, done that, and they're the ones that you want to poach to come to your company and help you build your team. So when you say passive candidate, you're not saying that they're passive candidates. You're just saying that they're not actively looking for a job. Yes, exactly. We, and we've gotten that from time to time. What do you mean you're looking at passive candidates? No, we don't really want passive candidates. But I like that. I like the idea of, of finding folks who aren't looking for a job. And instead of the old tried and true way of uh, posting but uh, jobs on Indeed or Career Builder or uh, getting some recruiters just slow at throwing resumes at you left and right of people who are actively looking for a job. And, and that's honestly, that's something that we've talked a, a lot about and, and not to get off topic, but we talked about this a little bit in our earlier, earlier pieces of the foundational series around how to hire better, that typically what companies will do is they'll go and they'll Google a job description and then they'll stick it on a job board and they'll go and, and you know, get a, a group of applicants and hire from that group of applicants. But is that really now that you know the difference between an, a, an active candidate and a passive candidate and that most passive candidates aren't looking, is that really the best way to go hire talent? Or do you need to take a step back, understand your business strategy, under, understand your, your strategy as a business, and really, and really understand the role to get the right person for the position? I like that. I also want to encourage uh, entrepreneurs to be careful about the, um, the network uh, promotion, if you will, the candidate that comes through and from their network that's like, hey, this guy or this gal is, is going to be great for your sales leader role. Usually those are out of work candidates as well. And it's it's interesting. I don't usually get those types of resumes when that person's still gainfully employed. They just happen to be a great candidate when they are actively looking for a job. So just be a little bit careful with those network recommendations. Amy, the audience knows we work mostly with entrepreneurial companies and it takes a special skill set to be able to work and adapt in a roll up your sleeves, get stuff done, entrepreneurial environment. Tell me a little bit about what I should be looking for if I have a company that is a very entrepreneurial state. I'm a big believer in past performance as an indicator of future success. Um, so typically if we're looking for candidates to join an entrepreneurial company, we want them to have an entrepreneurial bit, right? So they might have spent early years within a larger organization like a Dell or a, group, a Google that are very process rich, um, very training rich, and that's great. But we don't want them to be a serial can a candidate who has serially spent their career from big company to big company to big company. Some of that earlier in their career or at points in their career is great, but we really want them to have that the entrepreneurial spirit. We want them to have the capacity to roll up their sleeves 
and be nimble and work in environments where there isn't process, where they can build out the process and they can hire the team, right? So we're looking for candidates that have that exposure and they have the exposure to building and training teams in process deficient environments. And I think the other thing that you need to consider is candidates and people that are that are scrappy and they're nimble. That they've got those qualities, and that's a when we're talking to to clients, that I would say those are two terms that are thrown out over and over and over. It needs to be scrappy, needs to be nimble, needs to be a problem solver, and and be self directed. Because in a lot of entrepreneurial companies, there just isn't that capacity to drive them. They need, they need to be self-driving. I think that's absolutely true. We have to, entrepreneur companies have to figure things out sometimes or a lot of times. And I, I liken it to the NASA astronauts who you know got sent to the moon. We just have to figure it out, right? We don't have the all the tools. We just have to figure it out. And I, and I think that there, there's an important point to make. And, and there's a there's a balance between being reactive and 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 and, and, and planning, right? So when we think about doing those strategic talent plans and when we think about you know looking at top talent and we look at the kinds of qualities that we need in, in companies like these, there's a, an aspect of you're building the plane while you're flying it. And that's in most entrepreneurial companies, that's not going to change. But but you can take it take it back a step and put a little bit more structure and a little bit more foundation around how you're building the plane while you're flying. I love it. Amy, anything else you'd like to add as far as recruiting the right talent for your business? Yeah, you know, there is one more thing I'd like to add, Kurt. And I, I know I said earlier that candidates that have that been there, done that are, are really critical for, for roles, but I think there's also, you know, you need to take into to consideration the level of the role. So in some roles, we advocate what we call hypo, a high potential person. They, they might have more limited years of experience, but they've got a track record of success, meaning that they've been promoted. They might only have four years of experience, but maybe they've been promoted three times within the same company to roles of expanding you know, priority and, and experience. So there are there are considerations to make around, do I need been there, done that? Or can I look at somebody who's more high potential? And also there's budgetary constraints to take into account with both levels. So the skills I'm looking for in a hypo besides being promoted a few times or things like grit, scrappiness, um, problem solving, um, you know, engagement, you know, there's there's a comment that that somebody I used to work with made, but it's stuck with me. When you are describing a situation or a position, does somebody lean in or do they back away? And you want those folks that maybe they don't have the experience, but they lean into the challenge. So Amy, what's your uh, biggest takeaway for this episode, uh, recruiting the right talent for your business? Top talent matters. You want to recruit people who are not looking. Give me the ball, boss. I love it. Yep, I love absolutely. It. Thank you so much for having me again. I, this is one of those really wonderful topics for me. I could talk about all day. And I'm excited to talk about today's topic around how do we design a, an interview process that's attractive. So let me uh, tee a few things up and let me just say most recruiting people think of just that seat I need to fill. Let's get somebody in that seat as fast as humanly possible. But I want you to go through the stages and the steps involved in a, in a good, effective recruiting process. So phase one on, in, in our opinion, is, is scoping. And it's what I talked about earlier around foundational pieces. It's how do I build the right blueprints, right? So scoping is where you ask yourself and your team, how does a position dovetail with and drive our overall business strategy? So you're looking at expectations for the role, outcomes for the role, what you want them to achieve in the, you know, the next six months to a year that are going to drive that business strategy, who's going to report to them, who they will report to. It's all of the, the really specifics that are uh, company uh, related that don't have anything to do so much with necessarily with the job, right? You can pull a job description, but these are the things that are specific to your business. So I was going to ask you, I've got a job description. I've got what I need, right, Amy? Yeah, no, you don't. You've got a job description and that's great, but there's a whole lot more that, that goes into it besides the job description. Absolutely. You got metrics, you got KPIs, you got to understand what you want those people to achieve. You need to understand what kind of a temperament do they need to have based on you know what your team looks like. Do they need to have management experience? Do they need to have team building experience? There's a, there's a lot of specifics that go into understanding a role. You just listed a lot. Let me invite the, the viewers to uh, to reach out to us. Just go to our website, hirebetter.com. If you'd like, have some consultation, maybe a free scoping exercise. We're happy to help you build out that right blueprint. All right. So Amy, what's step number two? So step number two is sourcing. And sourcing is, is kind of the special, the magic sauce around, around search. 
And that's really building your talent pool. That's looking at competitors. That's looking at speakers. That's reaching out to your network and identifying a pool of candidates that are going to be a fit for your position. They said speakers, I assume you mean speakers at different trade shows, conferences, whatnot? Yeah, I mean, you think about who thought leaders are, and you're looking for people who are thought leaders and subject matter experts, and those people are typically sought after for speaking engagements and to be in, in membership organizations. Nice. Another great source, yeah. yeah. But the key is people who aren't looking for a job, right? People who aren't looking for a job. Well, uh, tell me about step number three. So step number three is the interview process, and the interview process is really critical. What we've seen through most of our work is that most companies, most hiring managers don't know how to interview. So it's really important that you get this part right. So in the old days, I would be printing the resume of the candidate I'm going to speak with on my way to the conference room to meet with them. You're telling me there's something more involved than that? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's much more involved than that. And what we see is that companies will have hiring managers go in and they won't even be prepared for the interview. So they'll ask you know, a stock list of five questions. And then a week later, the candidate will come in for another interview and, and the next person in the interview process will ask the same stock five questions. And when you think about best practices and being on the receiving end of that, it's probably not the way you'd want to interview. Yeah, I can't imagine A players like to hear uh, you know, people not be prepared for an interview. You're not really selling your company if you're not prepared. I like uh, some of the stuff that you guys do uh, with uh, giving each person in the interview process a different role. For example, Uh, The team doesn't let me truly interview because I like everybody. Uh, The team asked me to sell the vision of Hire Better. And I I know you do the same thing for our clients as well. And you also, I think, are a good, like, assess for culture. Um, But we wouldn't ask you to assess somebody's financial acumen, right, or their sales acumen or their delivery acumen. We would ask the people that are experts in that field to touch on the questions they need to. So you're getting an interview process that's very well-rounded where a candidate might be asked, Different, different questions by each subject matter expert, and then they come together and they've got a cohesive idea of the candidate as a whole. We're on to step number four. So step number four is negotiating your offer. And you know we talked about earlier in the foundational pieces of these, this series, how important it is to, to understand what the, the mission and the vision and the selling of the opportunity is that happens in the interview process a little bit. It also happens in negotiating the offer. And you know I know we said that that was critical, but in today's market, with the dynamics around salary and counter offers being rampant, negotiating the offer is really important. And so understanding what market is going to bear for the different levels that you're hiring for, it's really critical. Guys, if you're interested, we would uh, be happy to supply some salary surveys. We have access to a lot of data. Just reach out to us at HireBetter.com and we'll be happy to connect with you. Just realize that even the salary surveys that we have today are a little bit out of date because uh the market is moving so fast, I would add 15 to 20% to most of the salary surveys. Yeah, you, you just took the words out of my mouth, Kurt. I was just about to interrupt you and say, but wait. Um, but the, the thing that's great about the work that we do is because we're in the market actively, we can triangulate you know, against salary survey versus what we've seen for recent offers um, and, and the gut check that we can give around the searches that we've conducted more recently. I like it. I think one of the uh, important things for uh, most of you entrepreneurs out there is don't lowball your candidates. You're not going to get a game changing candidate if you come in with a lowball offer and try to negotiate them to something really, really uh, minuscule. Uh, go know what you need and go out and get it. Well, and, and the, there's a point that I'd like to make around that, Kurt, and it's that you might get somebody to accept a lowball offer, but they're going to be looking at uh, Actively, it's not like they're going to come on board and be happy. They're going to continue to entertain offers because I can tell you most candidates are getting five to 10 reach outs a day right now. Wow. All right. Well, what's step number five, Amy? So step number five is onboarding. And I always say this onboarding actually starts in the interview process because it's all about setting the right vision for the candidate. It's all about making the right first impression. Um, But onboarding is really about how do you bring the candidate into your business. And that's really, uh, you know, so much of that, it's again, it's about planning. So it's about putting together 30, 60, 90 day plans and making sure that they have a a great first day, a great first week and a great first month and onward. Yeah, that's so critical. Uh, I see so many people who are just, uh, hey, bathrooms uh, on, you know, second floor and uh, here's your computer. Yeah, we we actually had a client that um, that gave the candidate a computer and pointed him to his desk. And that was the extent of his onboarding. And now he's, he's a flight risk. He's looking because he's, his experience has proven to be equally um, unimpressive as he's been an employee over the last couple of weeks. Yep. We've got to be, continue 
not necessarily selling, but continuing to build that relationship over that first 90 days, guys, so that you can get off on the right foot because first impressions are really, uh, really so important. Yep, absolutely. All right, Amy, anything else you'd like to add about uh, designing an effective recruiting process? Well, if there's anything I'll say, it's understand your team, understand what your hiring manager's capabilities are. The fact of the matter is that unless you worked at a, a large company like a Dell or an Intel, et cetera, most people have not had formal training around the hiring and interviewing process. So if your team doesn't have it, you need to invest the money and invest the time to make sure that they get up to speed. Because if you don't have the right inputs, you're not going to get the right outputs. I mean, a couple of questions I get a lot from clients is, is how do you deal with assessments, like personality assessments, as well as interviewing techniques? That's one of those things that's so important to, to get right. We've worked with clients that use assessments as a knockout tool. And when, when you do that, you're missing out on a huge proportion of candidates that would be a wonderful fit for a position. So if you're going to use an assessment, my advice would be to, to pick one judiciously and then use it just as a data point, right? There's People are complex beings and an assessment is just one part of the picture. So when you say don't use it as a knockout, you mean don't kick people out just because they didn't get the proper score that you're looking for in the assessment, but use it as a data point, I think is what you just said. Exactly. Exactly. I think that what we've seen from, from certain clients is that they use it as a filter on the front end of a search. And so they're filtering out all kinds of great talent um, that would be, you know, would be a fit, but they've set a, a, an arbitrary parameter around what a person should look like. And, and, and again, people are complex and they show up with the head, they show up with the heart, and they show up with their experience. Well, so what about uh, interview techniques? Another really interesting one, what we've all been trained on, and, and I think the, the model that's the most successful is behavioral interviewing. And I referenced this again earlier in, in the process when we were talking about um, the importance of, of core values. It's behavioral interviews is about, tell me about a time when, right? Tell me about a time when X. And when you're asking those questions rather than yes, no questions, you get a lot more meat on the bone around how somebody's built and how they're geared. Well, one final thing I just thought of is reference checks. I know that there's a couple of schools of thoughts on that. Tell me uh, what your school of thought is. Uh, my school of thought is you get great information. There are people that are pessimist about it because they say, oh, well, those are those are references that were provided me. Of course, they're not going to say anything negative. What we've found is that they have a lot of really positive things to say, coaching aspects that we can use around management, how they like to communicate, autonomy, all kinds of all kinds of really great things that we can build into an onboarding and a training program for them. Nice. Amy, what is the one big takeaway from this section, designing an effective recruiting process? So my, my big takeaway, Kurt, is to make sure that your team is trained on interviewing. They need to know the process for interviewing and the questions to ask to get the right candidates. I love it. I'm going to switch the word retain with the word attract, because we want to not only attract great uh, talent to our company, but we want to attract them and keep them happy and keep them productive members of our team. Talk to me a little bit about what you think is are some of the key strategies around attracting and retaining good talent. I, you know, I love that concept of attracting because I, I think, you know, retention means I'm trying to keep them. I think about attraction and I think about continually attracting people, right? Like it's, it's a marriage. You want your husband to be continually attracted to you. And so that's the way I think that companies need to approach it. You know, when we think about retention methods, there are so many things that are swirling around in the world today, right? And we're, again, we're in this world of, of salaries that are extremely dynamic and counter offers. We're in a world of people wanting to have meaningful, thoughtful work. And so as you think about your business, think about the things that you can do, the actions that you can take that are going to help you continually attract candidates and, and, and employees. And that means benefits. You know, benefits are so important. It means work-life balance. It means, you know, flexibility around the location. Where do people live? You don't necessarily have to only go with the candidates that are in your backyard, right? But you can attract and retain great talent by giving them flexibility in their work environments. I think that salary is a component of it, right? Salary is always a component and, and people at the end of the day, they do need to be able to support themselves and their families. But, you know, there's other things that you can consider as well. For many entrepreneurial companies, one of the 
big pieces that they use is equity, right? Or or bonus that is tied to company performance long-term as a means to retain top talent. Amy, in previous episodes, we've talked about selling candidates on what we're doing as an organization. Now that I've got this candidate on my team, I can't just sell them because the reality is gonna hit what's real and what's not. Yep. Tell me a little bit about uh, living your reality. I think that's so important. You know, we've seen that companies can maybe attract somebody, but if um, so much data is showing right now that the biggest reason that candidates or, or employees are making a move is because the vision that was sold to them on the front end does not align with the vision that they experience or the 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 values that they experience when they actually come into the company. So making sure that you really are you know, tied to that is so important. So those core values and mission vision we talked about, we have to, they have to be real. They can't they have to be words real. on a wall. Yes, they have to be real. They can't just be words on a wall. And, and that starts with the very top, right? That, that's something that filters from leadership. So having leaders that believe in that and having every member of your team believe in it and espouse it is, is critical. I love it. This is also where things like the onboarding that we talked about last time is so critical. If we don't have a robust and rich onboarding process, we may lose people before they get fully engaged, right? Absolutely. And, and I think that that's the, you know, there's that importance around having a 30, 60, 90 day plan. And, and it's not something that you roll out to your employee and say, this is what we're going to have you do. In most instances where it's most effective, it's co-developed. So if I can say anything, it would be co-develop that plan with your employee, have a baseline, but then let them have buy-in and make sure that they understand what they're being expected to do. One other thing that I've heard a lot from our uh, candidates that we're talking to is the importance of training and development. People want a career path. They want to not just, again, have a paycheck. They want to have a future. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing with your candidates and your clients. Oh, absolutely. I, I would say that that's one of the bigger ones right now. People want to have access to continued improvement. And so if I could encourage anybody on anything, it would be have quarterly sit downs with your direct reports and really understand it's an open forum. It's their time to share with you what they're looking for long term. And it's your job as a manager to understand how you can get them there. Hopefully they're gonna get there with your company, but maybe some of their goals are longer term, 10 years or 15 years. What are the iterative steps that you can take to get them to their long-term career goal? Amy, tell me how important the, the leadership team is to retaining top talent. And I think that, again, it's everything flows from the top down. And, and the biggest thing that companies can do for their employees is to build trust. Part of the way that you build trust is by being open kimono. So that means financials, that means strategy, long-term plans, sharing with your team what your long-term plan is helps to build trust. And then having open conversations about any concerns that employees have around those items further builds trust. Amy, is there anything else you'd like to add as far as retaining top talent in today's market? Let's say two. Invest in your people with time and resources and then continue to sell the dream live up to your promises. I love it. Live up to your promises. Well, folks, that's a wrap on our series on talent, how to hire better. Thank you, Amy and Sarah, for joining me. And if any of these five episodes interest you, please reach out to us at hirebetter.com. We are the strategic talent partner for entrepreneurial companies, and we'd love to see how we can help you today. Until next time, let's go. Mm -hmm.